All right, uh, thank you all for joining us today um, from LinkedIn, our community page and, and Zoom. Um, hello and welcome. My name is Ryan Correa. I'm co-founder and managing director at Equivesto. Um, you know, I'm joined today with my fellow co-founder, Alexander Morsink. Today, this, today's webinar is designed to help you get to know us better, uh, walk through sort of our origin story, uh, why we do what we do, how we got here, where we're headed, and answer any questions you may have about Equivesto or our active race. Uh, the session today is designed to be interactive, so if you ever have a question, feel free to pop it in the chat and we'll try our best to answer it. First off, we have Alex, who will give us a brief bio of himself and his roles and responsibilities at Equivesto. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, prior to founding Equivesto, I worked for a number of years uh, in corporate and commercial banking at Scotiabank. My roles there focus predominantly on credit risk management and working uh, as part of a team at the bank to assess the risk of a variety of different borrowers and uh, companies using financial products created by the bank. In the corporate banking team, it was really focused on financial institutions. So we worked directly on approving loans, derivatives, and other uh, financial instruments to governments, other banks, uh, mutual funds, private funds, uh, insurance companies, uh, different things like that. And then I also spent some time in commercial banking, also on the credit risk side. On the commercial banking side, I had my own portfolio of hundreds of loans to many small businesses across Canada. And I was responsible for reviewing their credit worthiness and then extending them a variety of financial products. My experience at the bank really highlighted not only uh, the variety of ways that you can you know, help finance and provide capital to larger you know, international financial institutions, but also the capital needs of Canadian small businesses and really crystallized the situation where as a company's need for additional financial support might increase at the same time, that is exactly when potentially their credit worthiness may go down. And so the banks will be less willing to provide capital. And it really demonstrated the need for additional financing options for small businesses in the community. My experience on the corporate banking side really helped bolster my understanding of capital raising on an institutional level and the way that you know, mutual funds, private funds, and a variety of other financial institutions structure and prepare their own capital raises and even IPOs. At Equivesto, I've translated a lot of that education and experience into my role as manager director and the ultimate designated person. Essentially, I'm responsible for a lot of the finance things. I'm the fin to Ryan's tech and leading the due diligence work that we do on all the companies, the structuring of the deals, uh, the valuations and the planning, as well as the compliance pieces that we cover here. Uh, the UDP role is something that's required for an exempt market dealer, which is the license that uh, we carry at Equivesto. And essentially the UDP, as the name sir, uh, sort of explains, is the ultimate designated person. So the buck essentially stops with me and I'm responsible for the actions of all of the members of the Equivesto team with regard to the regulators and our requirements uh, from the compliance side to make sure that we're protecting the investors on the platform, the issuers who are raising capital with us, and the entire private capital markets industry. Now I'll pass it on to Ryan to run through his bio. Thanks, Alex. Uh, prior to Equivesto, I founded two early stage uh, startups. Uh, first was Ed and all of her partners, a technology analysis and strategy consultancy aimed at affordable and fractional business analysis, design thinking, tech strategy for SMEs, uh, essentially. And a second one was this, as actually an early stage tech startup called ShareBud, which was a digital marketplace for neighbors to rent items from one another, start, such as sporting goods, electronics, and other household items. Ultimately, both these companies were wrapped up, but taught me lifelong lessons in running a business, the importance of capitalization, how to build a modern piece of technology, and how to operate a successful consumer-facing marketplace. Beyond moonlighting as an entrepreneur, I also worked for over four years as, as a technology consultant at Inforica Inc., a Canadian-based IT consultancy that delivers enterprise solutions for global companies in healthcare, energy, IT, and the insurance space. As part of my role, I was placed at several Fortune 500 companies to help 
analyze and plan and deliver on large scale digital transformation projects. And this experience eventually led to a pretty robust understanding of how to effectively manage technical teams and ultimately bring a software product to market. My key responsibilities at Equivesto include managing all the technology you interact with and the back office infrastructure that essentially keeps the lights on, um, doing any R&D on new technologies in the fintech space that we're looking to implement, uh, design creatives, build brand and implement marketing strategy, advising issuers on campaign marketing strategy and, uh, and page design. And uh, of course the community building uh, and bringing people together and also the partner network development. Talent management and human resources is also a big part of my day and other administrative aspects of the business. So I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, how Equivesto got started, you know, where did this all begin, our or, or origin story. And, um, you know, it, it really stems back to, you know, Alex and I were, were classmates in business school, you know, housemates and eventually best friends prior to starting Equivesto. Um, we always said that we would one day start a business together. And, and you know, after university, you know, Alex went off and started a career in finance and myself in technology. And we, we saw it fitting to eventually start a FinTech. Um, it was a little over five years ago, uh, five years ago that Alex and I came together to build a better way to raise early stage equity in Canada. We both had personal experiences trying to raise funds for past startups with little success. And throughout the journey, we discovered that you know, stringent regulation and conservative investment mentalities were among the largest barriers to sourcing capital in Canada. Simply put, there are not nearly enough active angels, angel investors to meet the growing needs of wanting businesses. There was also a clear equity cap to, to capital for BIPOC and women-led businesses uh, that we believe stem from a lack of private investment access or diverse investors. The barrier of wealth and requirement to be an accredited investor to invest in private companies was, a limiting, was limiting the pool of potential investors. And data showed that investor representation is almost identical to the demographics of founders who eventually get funded. Luckily, there was in, back in 2017, the concept of equity crowdfunding, a democratized version of angel investing was blossoming in the US and UK, inviting a new type of investor to participate, the self-directed retail investor, also known as the general public. And like all financial products in Canada, we were well behind in adoption, but Alex and I saw this as an opportunity to bring what had been globally proven here to Canada. So, Thanks, I'll pass it over to Alex to, to talk about a little bit about what we're doing now. Thanks, Ryan. So since getting incorporated to where we are in 2022, you know, what have we been doing in these past five years other than, other than uh, you know, sitting around uh, and, uh, and hosting webinars? Um, we got our license as an exempt market dealer in 2020 and launched the platform uh, shortly thereafter. Um, and so we've been operational since 2020. But let's talk a little bit about what's actually happened sort of earlier than that. Maybe that's a a little bit boring, but it'll provide more context as to sort of how we got here. So between 2017 and 2020 was really all about building the platform and understanding the regulatory and legal requirements to actually operate something like this in Canada. When we started out, it wasn't clear exactly to us because we were new to this space, what the rules would be like and how we would need to operate something like this. So we both set out to learn the things we would need to and sort of become masters in our own domain. Ryan focusing on understanding, okay, what would the technology requirements would be to sort of build and, and host and manage a platform like this. And then myself understanding what is the regulatory space around raising capital in this way. From my experience before, I understood the sort of lending infrastructure and how you know funds and other institutions on the larger financial side were able to get access to capital. But in terms of the equity securities and actually getting investment from the general public, that was something that was new. So we spent a lot of time going through all of the regulations provided by the Ontario Securities Commission and the other uh, securities commissions across Canada to actually understand, okay, is this space regulated? Who regulates it? What are the rules that you need to meet to be able to do something like that process? We learned that, okay, to be able to 
basically take money from the general public as investors and help put that money into different companies, you need it to be licensed as something that's called an exempt market dealer. Essentially, an exempt market dealer is um, a, a licensed financial institution that deals in the securities of the exempt market. In English, what that means is you're offering those securities to investors, so you're dealing them, and you're doing it in the exempt market, the exempt market being private companies that aren't publicly listed on a stock market. So what's involved in becoming an exempt market dealer? Essentially, the role of the exempt market dealer is to protect the entire industry. So to complete due diligence and something called KYP or know your product on every uh, investment opportunity that they would offer to their clients. Essentially, any company that we want to bring onto our platform becomes a product, an investment product that we are then offering directly to investors. So we needed to complete a full KYP sort of analysis on each one of those companies. And then at the same time, we needed to actually provide investment advice to these investors. Exempt market products and investments in private companies are considered high risk by the Canadian securities regulators because you won't be able to get your funds out right away because the company is not regulated in the same way as a public company would be because you're not able to sell your security to someone else. Um, and they're typically in higher risk industries. And so the combination of all of those things means when you're onboarding an investor, even if they only want to come for $100, you have to do a full know your client or KYC process and suitability process to understand that person's personal situation, their financial details, and whether these type of investments make sense for them, because we have so much more knowledge than they would about you know, how this space operates. On top of fulfilling those functions, there's a lot of requirements that an exempt market dealer itself has um, as part of the review and ongoing compliance to the government. So we have a, a massive list that's outlined by the government of, of things that we have to do in order to make sure that they understand what we're doing, we're following the government's rules, and we're implementing those rules in the right way. So little things like keeping all communication records for seven years, uh, having fully audited financial statements, providing ongoing reporting to the regulators about our situation uh, as an exempt market dealer, having a certain amount of excess capital in a bank account that we never use. Um, you know, there's all these kind of different things that we have to have and maintain, you know, exams and courses that have to be passed by employees in certain positions. There's a very long list of things that are required, but essentially the idea is to ensure that we as an exempt market dealer are able to operate in the space and protect the whole investing ecosystem, protecting the investors, protecting the, the companies raising capital and protecting all Canadians. And learning all of the pieces that were involved in doing that and preparing those documents, preparing all of that information that's required to become an exempt market dealer, as well as building the technology, that took us essentially three years. Um, for about a year and a half of that, we were in communication with the OSC and had submitted our application to them. And we were going back and forth, sitting down with them for hours to go through, okay, how does your platform work? What happens when they go to this page? to, okay, we're going through your long policies and procedures document. And it says here, you know, in this scenario, you're going to call the client. What happens if you call the client and they say this, that level of detail and that level of scrutiny was put onto our business by the regulators. And we spent basically the three years getting all of that ready. So finally, we got approved in 2020 and launched. Now we get to the exciting part and not, not so boring anymore, I promise. Since 2020, we've run over 20 campaigns for a number of different companies and helped raise over 3 million for those, raising um, basically a, an additional million of that 3 million since just the beginning uh, of this year. So really we're seeing a huge increase in growth in interest in equity crowdfunding and the ability to use this model successfully for businesses to raise capital, but also at the same time for the general public and investors to actually participate in a larger number of businesses. In 2021, there was um, 
some discussion with the regulators about modifying the rules. The rules initially implemented in Canada were much more restrictive than those in the US and the UK. And so we were quite happy to participate actually and provide feedback to the regulators as well as a few other members of the uh, exempt market dealer community around these new rules. And so we actually helped through our feedback craft the new, the totally new prospectus exemption 45110 startup crowdfunding, which is used across Canada and unifies the equity crowdfunding rules for the whole country. So we were, um, we were quite proud to be able to participate even in a small way in helping create these new rules for everyone. Um, and that's really sort of helped bring us to where we are today. So Ryan, tell us about uh, what's happening next. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, this might not answer your question, Mike. I see. I see your question there on the side. Um, where Where are we headed next? You know, um, as you're most likely aware, we're currently running a community round on our own platform uh, to help grow our business and, and service even more companies. Some of our main goals um, post raise include, you know, broadening our broadening our investor base. We want to go across Canada and market to new audiences. So that's really a big part of this is is growing growing the community base that is allowed to and participate. Right now, we're only in four provinces, Ontario, BC, Alberta, and Nova Scotia, but we want to get to all the provinces, get to Quebec, uh, which is a big, um, big area that we're, we're trying to get to, but obviously requires us to develop everything in French, uh, legal documents included. So that's, that's a big, I, I guess, hurdle that we need to, to overcome. Then also improve the user experience. So what, what we mean by that is implementing smarter technology to help speed up the processes that already exist in our business. You know, we still want to you know, remain compliant and secure, but at the same time, implement technology that can help people, for example, sign up faster. Um, so our onboarding forms, they are quite, um, I guess, extensive, but a requirement that we need to get done in order to keep everyone safe. So running our KYC and AML, we need to collect a bunch of information that sometimes takes people additional amount of time. There are technologies out there that are starting to be implemented across Canada on different types of platforms that we're looking to implement to, to help speed up that process. So that's one of the key areas that we're looking to implement, uh, implement some technology. Other areas that we're looking at is, is um, registered accounts. Of course, um, the, the ideas and the concepts around investing through your TFSA and RRSP are, are very attractive to a lot of different types of investors. That process is mostly managed through, I think there's only three providers here in Canada, and we're looking to, to speed up the process of signing up on those as well. So either through collaboration with the existing players or getting into that space ourselves. Um, we're also looking to expand our team. That's a really big part of this. Um, right now, we're a really tight team, Alex and myself. We wear many hats. I'm both technology and tech and, and marketing at our business. Alex is, is compliance, finance, you know, sales, everything. Um, I think you know, we've reached a point in our business where um, we need a little bit of de delineation in, in, in terms of tasks and responsibilities. So we want to grow our team so we can service even more clients and uh, add to the already extensive amount of uh, attention we give to our uh, to our customers and clients and users we want to if we we're going to grow our base we need to at least put more people in play to to service these these new clients um we also want to list way more companies you know we're really proud to say that um just this weekend we're going to be listing eight new companies um which is uh, a record for ourselves um we most most months we have probably between four to six companies listed at any given time. Uh, we'll have at the, at the, at that time I think fourteen companies active. So we're definitely on an upwards trajectory um, in terms of the amount of companies that we're bringing in to to list on our platform. And this also provides investors a more diverse um, uh, amount of companies to 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 I guess uh, split up their 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 investments into different options and have a wider variety of companies to choose from. We also want to develop more free education. I think this also goes back to the user experience side. Um, you know, the private markets information is extremely um, unavailable, I would say, to, to the average person in Canada. And there's not a lot of literature specifically about the Canadian markets and the exempt markets. So we want to do our best and we've already tried to, to you know we've created a learning center we've created a community page where people can talk to us uh, but we want to expand on that and create even more 
educational and free educational material for the public to, to consume so that they can, you know, start to see themselves as angel investors. I think, um, you know, this has been an area that has, has usually only been accessed by people who are essentially in the know, have the network, um, but we want to broaden that and, and bring in um, that key information so that it's consumable by, by the general public. So we're going to be focusing a lot on financial literacy for investors and also developing more uh, materials for companies who are looking to, say, raise their first uh, private round. And, you know, they've, they've done their friends and family round. They're looking at angels. They're looking at a community round uh, through Ecovesto. Um, you know, how do I do it? How can I learn about this? We want to provide that information. Um, and then some other areas, we want to grow our partner net network. I think that's another area that we're going to be focusing on right after this raise. You know, we've, we've pulled together quite a few reputable partners in, in you know, the accelerators, incubators, um, other people who are part of the ecosystem. We just want to make sure that, it, you know, the way that we hit the market is very cohesive um, for startups and small businesses who are looking to raise capital um, opposed to you know, just doing our own thing and, and not really knowing startups, not really knowing where to where, where they sit and, and how how can the education they receive from an accelerator uh, continue on to to uh, to doing a crowdfunding round with Equivesto. So we we're going to really work hard over the next uh, few months on on broadening our partner network. And then finally, you know, building new products. Another area is is, of course, through our R&D, uh, de delivering more products that are, you know, to the best benefit of our users. You know, we're looking for uh, some really good user feedback. We've grown our base to over 3000 members now, and we want to access those members to to figure out, you know, what do they want? What do they need? Um, you know, a lot of what we've developed so far is based on, you know, global precedents, um, but definitely Canada is a place where uh, and it's gone to a maturity level where we can start to to innovate and, and create new things that maybe doesn't exist in other places. So that's another big area that we want to look into and and looking for very critical feedback from people like yourselves who are on this call who are anxious about, you know, participating and investing in us. We, we're going to incorporate our, our, our investors in the decisions we make when we're developing new products. Awesome. So I think I think that's pretty much enough from us. Um, let's let's jump straight into Q and A. I think that's that's the big biggest part about this. We want to answer all your questions. So feel free to pop in questions into into uh, into the chat. I could see already a few coming in, and we also have some on LinkedIn and our community page. So I have those here, and I'll, I'll bring those up afterwards. Um, so Alex, the first question um, it comes from Mike. I think I answered your first question, Mike, but let's, let's just answer it. Uh, let's ask it again. Um, what, what are some ideas that you, you have in terms of improving your user experience? Yeah. So essentially when people are signing up on Equivesto, we really get two types of feedback. One from people who've invested in private companies before, like angel investors, and they're saying, this is the greatest thing in the entire world. Your investment process is so easy. The transaction process is so easy. I, I love it. It's fantastic. It's so quick. And on the other hand, you know, our main target audience as well, which is you know, members of the general public who might not have gotten into investing before. And compared to signing up on something like Amazon, the sign-up process feels long. There's all these questions that we're asking that people don't understand why. And then when it comes to transacting, you know, you have to remember and get your blank check information and put it in. And if you have a typo, it cancels the transaction. So we've we've been very happy and very proud of the work that we've done to date to really improve the user experience compared to sort of a traditional paper-based investment process. But we know there's so much more to do in the future. I think just off the top of our heads, a lot of the things that we want to look at implementing is speeding up that investment account creation process and helping provide additional information through the process. So right now there's basically a form and you have to fill it out. And there's little, little information buttons if you have questions something like changing the way that the form flows so that there's some information that's being asked, but up top, there's like a video which sort of has someone explaining as a person to person, hey, this is why we need this, is it, this information from you. This is our role. This is our license. Having that sort of integrated, having the process be potentially have slightly more pages, but flow a little bit easier. And so the process is kind of, you are guided through it uh, and your hand is 
there. Also, when it comes to making the transaction, instead of asking for you know, the three lines uh, from a blank check, instead, it allows you to connect it by logging into your personal bank account. And then you can actually choose which account there you want to transact from. These are some of the things that we're thinking about just to try to improve the entire process and make it faster. I know we've also gotten some feedback around um, the document signing, and sometimes the document can appear a little bit small, and it's not able to be blown up. So that's one thing that's also uh, quite high on the list to improve. Exactly. And, and then one other area is, all, is, the, um, is the investor experience from, um, from the sort of analysis side of, of, of the companies. I think, you know, as a platform, we, we can't give too much opinion on, on the business. We could obviously verify it, but, um, you know, we're looking at partners currently to, to help us with, with some of that analysis side. So uh, a third party who would come in, do some, you know, due diligence on the, is this an investable uh, company? What are some comparables? You know, having that level of uh, sort of investment analysis so that you as an investor can, can look at this third party information from, from, from valid and validation from these, these external experienced investors so that you can make a better decision. Um, you know, obviously the public markets has a lot of that. Um, like Morningstar and stuff like that, but there, there's nothing really being done in the private space. And what we're seeing in the United States and the UK is a lot of these firms are starting to be set up because crowdfunding is becoming such a, the norm. Um, you know, I think it's additionally important that uh, these types of uh, companies and these types of partnerships are, are being brought to market. So that's something that we're looking at currently. Okay, cool. The uh, next question was, what's the story behind your name? Ah, that's a great question. Uh, so our name Equivesto is a combination of really um, two or three concepts. It's taking equity and equality and combining that with investment. And then we just threw the O on at the end. But the idea is really allowing a more equitable and equal access to investment opportunities in the private space. And so we kind of took, you know, equity and equality, equi, and then uh, the, the sort of second half of invest, uh, vest, and then Oh, to sort of create Equivesto. That's the idea. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to grab a question from one of our other pages. Okay, why why raise a community round, Alex? So I think you know it's a it's a very good question. Equivesto continues to grow and expand, and as we mentioned earlier in the call, we're we're launching a, a record number of deals over this coming weekend, and there's a ton more interest. Uh, from, from companies and investors signing up. Ryan, we're actually almost at 3,500. I think we're gonna pass 3,500 users today. So, uh, and we'll be at 4,000 before you know it. So there continues to be more and more demand and that's driving our business to, to grow more and more. And we wanted to really provide that same opportunity to our community, all of you and everyone who's been you know, investing and participating through Equivesto and on the platform to be able to share in our growth, just like we're helping all of these out there companies do on our platform. We wanted to make sure that, okay, we're out here helping, you know, communities invest in businesses they care about. We should make sure that we can offer that same opportunity to our own community as well. Um, the business continues to grow and thrive, um, you know, without the, the need to necessarily go out and raise capital. But for us, the focus was really about providing that opportunity to the community rather than, you know, having people come in at a later stage. We knew we're at the beginning of potentially some really exciting growth and expansion in the business. And we wanted to allow our community to sort of get in just like we help communities get in for other companies on the platform, get in at the beginning, and then really be able to share in that potential success. That's great. Awesome. Okay, we have another one from Mike here. Uh, would you say this uptake in campaigns uh, is due to, you know, the, some new marketing strategy or have you implemented that you've implemented or simply a reflection of increased exposure? Uh, I think it's a combination of things. I think, to be honest, one of the biggest pieces, though, is the push to change the rules and the regulation around equity crowdfunding in Canada. Honestly, before this change that we helped implement in September of last year, the rules were usable, but in a very, very limited way. They weren't Canada-wide. The maximum a company could raise was $250,000 per campaign, and the maximum that a member of the general public could invest was only like $2,500 and then up to $5,000 with uh, EMD approval. So 
changing these rules really opened up the accessibility and usefulness of equity crowdfunding to much larger companies and to companies at different stages. So now you can equity crowdfund up to 1.5 million without needing financial statements. You can run as many campaigns as you like. And um, as long as investors are reviewed and deemed suitable, uh, the general public can invest up to $10,000 in offerings. So these changes really kind of brought Canada to, I would describe almost like a level playing field to where the UK and the US were about five, oh my goodness, six years ago when they, when they initially got their equity crowdfunding rules. And so the change in interest is really being driven by that, as well as just increased awareness about equity crowdfunding and the increased popularity just internationally. Um, we are continuing to focus very much on building strong relationships in the community. So yes, we're going out and, and advertising directly to businesses themselves, but oftentimes businesses who are looking to raise capital are also already following the steps to help grow and expand their business. They're working with an accelerator, they're working with an incubator, they're connected to an entrepreneurial community in their area. And so for us, we have continued to really build those relationships. And that's one area that we wanna build out further. The uh, companies raising that will be launching the, their campaigns over the weekend are all connected through one accelerator. That's actually its entire cohort of companies uh, you know, participate in this wide pitch event and then have them all be open for investment in real time. And that's what we're helping to facilitate. Amazing. Okay, I have another question here. Is Equivesto pushing for uh, changes to the law to allow investors to get a tax break um, from the feds or provincial government? Of course, they have that uh, the, the tax break in, in BC, but um, mm. Alex, I think he's asking about um, the rest of the provinces. Yes. You, you hit it on there, Ryan. So in BC, there is already something like that. Um, we are currently not um, pushing the regulators to implement something like that, but that's certainly something that we would want to be doing in the future. For us, the first thing we want to do is really also enable support for TFSA and RRSP investing. Um, you know, if we think about a tax break and the way in, in some other countries in the UK and, and similarly to BC, essentially the idea is, okay, you make an investment in a startup and essentially 50% of that is written off and then reduced from your taxes or, or some number to that extent. What is potentially much more powerful is being able to invest through your TFSA. And TFSA is obviously a tax-free savings account. And to, to be clear, I am not a tax specialist, so this is not uh, direct advice. Please speak to your own tax lawyer uh, and, ta and accountant before making decisions regarding your TFSA, but this is my, just solely my own opinion. Uh, the TFSA allows you to invest in businesses and not have to pay any taxes on the returns of that at any point in the future. So let's say you took your entire TFSA amount and you invested that in a startup, and in five or 10 years, the startup five or 10 times or, or a thousand times its value. Your TFSA, the funds in it would also increase by this massive amount. And then when you withdrew those funds from your TFSA, your TFSA contribution room the next year would increase by the amount you had withdrawn. So if you put $50,000 in a TFSA into a startup and that startup achieved unicorn status and went crazy and your 50,000 turned into 5 million, you take the 5 million out to you know go celebrate and buy a Ferrari or whatever it is you want to do, your contribution room in your TFSA is now 5 million larger. So suddenly you can hold your entire investment portfolio in your TFSA and be tax-free. That is extremely powerful and is um, quite underused because accessibility for TFSA investing in the private space is very limited. So our focus is immediately on trying to sort of change that and make that much simpler for people. People. That's kind of the first step we're focused on. Okay, great. I, I think you answered this already, but you know, uh, how do you, how do we source deals, Alex? So um, yeah, I, I touched on it already, but essentially we're we're out, you know, making ourselves available to companies all the time directly. But and it's easier for us to go and build a relationship already, you know, dozens and dozens of companies, and we can speak to them all there. So we're really focused on building out our relationships with accelerators, incubators, universities, um, entrepreneurial centers in different cities. If you look at our partnership page, it is quite extensive. Um, 
we we're connected with essentially almost all of the of the large uh, incubators and accelerators um, across Canada, and we're continuously building out those relationships. And it's not we don't want to approach the situation by coming with an ask. We're not approaching organizations saying, "Hey, we want more companies to sign up. We want to you know have more clients." We're always approaching it saying, "Hey, how can we help? How can we offer?" free education, free materials, free support, not just about equity crowdfunding, but we have a wide variety of expertise on the team. So it's also about how can we help startups with their financial projections? How can we help advise them on their business plan or their valuations or their pitch deck or their go-to-market strategy or their technology or their marketing? All these other pieces we're bringing and offering and we're being quite active in that to demonstrate our approach to the market. We are not here purely to be transactional, to try to have, you know, to make a lot of money and then get out and sell. Our focus is on being really active and supportive of the small business and entrepreneurial community and making a difference and really helping companies grow and be more successful, whether they pay us something or not, essentially. <laughs> That's right, Alex. Um, okay, here's a very direct question. How will I make money by investing in Equivesto? Yeah. So like any private investment, there are really three ways that you actually generate returns. The first is if the company itself becomes more profitable and decides to turn some of those profits into dividends. And then in that situation, you would receive direct payment from the company. So we have a current plan in Equivesto to grow to a certain size. And then at that point, begin to offer dividends. So that's something that we're working towards. And it's outlined further uh, on the campaign page. The next opportunity is if the company uh, eventually goes public or becomes available for secondary trading where an investor can sell their investment to another investor. Currently, Equivesto does not have any plans to IPO now or in the future, but as equity crowdfunding continues to develop and we are seeing this internationally, there is potential, while currently not available in Canada, to create legal secondary trading securities. That would allow an investor holding shares in Equivesto to sell that to another investor and gets their money back even without Equivesto going public and IPOing. So this is something that's a little bit longer term, but we're certainly you know, very aware of these changes and paying attention to how that might work in Canada. And then the final option is if the company is acquired. So this would be if another larger company bought Equivesto, they would buy out all the shares and all the investors would get paid out at that time. Um, we are seeing a lot of expansion in other um, markets and other platforms that are much larger looking to potentially in the next three to five years, expand their reach and acquire platforms in newer markets. Uh, and so we're starting to see investments being made by US platforms into UK platforms. A UK platform got bought in its entirety by a much larger US platform only a few months ago. And so we're seeing um, some of the more dominant players in the space start looking to acquire some of the newer, smaller players. Uh, really, in Canada, there's not very many uh, platforms at all, given the regulatory space. So the, the likelihood that somebody does reach out with uh, an offer to acquire us is, is certainly there. Yep. And I think this leads into the next question is like, why won't competition just set up shop here in Canada? Like if there's a U.S. platform, you know, they're, they're been processing billions of dollars. They're massive, well reputable. What, why wouldn't they just enter the Canadian space? That is a fantastic uh, question, and I can sort of answer that directly. The rules required to become an exempt market dealer to operate a platform in Ontario and in Canada happen to be the most restrictive, I believe, on the entire planet. Um, and so in terms of the requirements and the responsibilities that a platform has to meet in order to be able to operate here legally and meet the requirements of the regulators are so much more than what any other country is asking. If you have a U.S. platform that's been operating under a certain sort of regulatory environment and they've grown to quite a large scale, for them to enter a new market, but then have to essentially redesign everything, potentially add many more additional people, do all this additional work that they're not used to doing simply to get a license. I think from a expansion standpoint for them, it's much easier to simply acquire a platform in a country as opposed to trying to set up shop and operate one on their own. Also, even though it's been a number of years since equity crowding started internationally, you know, in the US and the UK, 
those markets are still very new and are growing very, very rapidly just internally in their own countries. And so the need to sort of go and expand, as, as I mentioned in my previous question, is only just starting. So it's not that we're in the middle of an aggressive sort of acquisition consolidation stage in the international equity crowdfunding market. It's still very early. So it's an opportunity for, for us to gather market share in Canada. And I don't think U.S. players are going to be acquiring companies in Canada until at least, you know, two or three years from now. Okay, that's great. Um, oh, good question here. Um, so say we don't hit our max goal. So a lot of the mm -hmm. assumptions that we put on our campaign page, Alex, is, is you know, based, yeah, based on, on the us hitting our, our max goal, you know, yeah. what do we do? Like, what, what, of, what of our goals are we not going to be able to reach and, and, and what, what is essentially going to happen at that point? Yeah, so obviously when you set uh, campaign goals, you set a minimum and a maximum raise target. And the minimum target is important because that is the minimum amount of money that you want to raise to be able to go out and achieve some of the milestones that, that you've set. For us and, and how we're operating Equivesto, we continue to grow and be more and more successful without the need to actually go out and raise capital at all. And our approach to, to raise capital was really about providing that opportunity for the community that can accelerate some of our growth plans. Of course, having you know, more money does that, but you know, they always say more money, more problems, uh, but hopefully not in this case. So um, it would potentially accelerate our growth plans, but we're certainly you know, well on track to continue to grow and achieve our milestones without actually needing to come in and raise the capital. Our focus was more about allowing the community to come in and, uh, and participate. And you know, we're already well past our uh, minimum raise target. That was more set just to you know, help have more feasibility with you know, bringing on the number of shareholders and everything and make things more efficient. Um, but we would certainly be able to go and achieve those same goals. It's just about adjusting the speed with which we can achieve them. Excellent. I hope that answered your question, Mike. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good one. Oh, there's another one here. Um, would you... Would you plan? Would the planned dividend payout oh. be on a quarterly basis or still undecided? So yeah. right now, um, there's no fixed guarantee of any dividends offered by Equivesto. Um, in our high level plan, our goal is to start being able to pay dividends out as a certain percentage of profits once we reach uh, annual net profits over uh, between two and five million. So that would be the first kind of milestone target for us to begin potentially paying dividends. Um, in order for us to sort of assess that, we would, of course, need to have a year where in that year we hit the minimum number of profits. At that time, then the board would decide how they would want to begin deploying and paying out the dividends. Um, and so that would be discussed at that time, but that would still be in a few years. What's our uh, shareholder count, Alex? Um, shoot. I think it's over 30. Now. Currently, I don't think oh, it's over thirty. I, I guess we haven't. I, I guess we haven't issued any of the new ones. But yeah, yeah, no, not not people who participated uh, through the campaign, but uh, pre-campaign. I think we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm gonna just say like less than twenty, but more than ten um, prior to the raise start. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, this is this is a really good one. Uh, you mentioned you vet companies before they list. How does your due, dil due diligence process work? Right. I think this is a really important question. How does our due diligence process work? And what is our responsibility as an exempt market dealer? And I really want to take a bit more time and sort of outline that. So if you think about the process of investing in a private company or just an, uh, an accredited investor on their own, this individual has you know, the pitch deck from the company. They've had some discussions. They're interested in investing. And then... They're essentially going to go to the company, say, hey, I want to invest, but I, I want to confirm that, you know, this is a good investment and these things are true and they make sense. So they're going to start trying to collect documents from that company to understand more details about what the company is saying, their ability to achieve their goals, but also, you know, are these things all structured and making sense? Because Equivesto is licensed as an exempt market dealer, we are legally responsible to understand and verify the information that is put on our platform because any company raising capital on our platform essentially becomes our product. 
if you imagine us like a grocery store, we need to make sure that you know something put in the apples box is an apple and it's not actually like you know a pile of garbage or it's a rotten apple. And so in terms of our responsibilities and where that goes potentially much beyond what a traditional angel investor might do as part of their due diligence is we are coming out to essentially verify on behalf of all of our investor clients everything the company is saying as part of their campaign and then presenting that in a straightforward and clearly understood way to investors. So when you come to a campaign page on Equivesto and the company is saying, you know, we have 12 clients so far and we hit over this in revenue and this, 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 and they, they're making these statements, oh, we have, you know, we've got 10 people on our wait list or whatever it is, all of the statements they are making there, we have privately verified previously. If somebody says, oh, I'm best friends with uh, Stephen Harper or, you know, uh, Mr. Trudeau, the prime minister, we have gone and verified that information before they can make those statements. And so our approach to the due diligence is really diving into the details of all of their documents. Okay, the company says they're coming to offer, you know, non-voting common shares. Have they changed their articles of incorporation to create those non-voting shares? What are the rights in the shareholders agreement and the amendment to the articles around those non-voting shares? Are there special protections like tag-along rights and drag-along rights for minority investors in the agreement? Is the agreement structured well to handle these type of shares? Is that taken care of? If the company is saying in their pitch deck that they have a minimum viable product and it's capable of these, these, these functions, we go and we look at it, we check, we make sure it's all done. We are not putting a company on the platform and saying, this company is the right investment for you. What we're doing is we're saying, these are companies that we have checked all the things that they're saying here. They've completed the offering document. All the risks and the potential risks of investing are fully outlined in the offering document attached to the campaign. We highly recommend investors review all of the documents available before investing, but we put all of the information there so that you as an investor can approach it and say, okay, I can see all this information. If they're saying it here, I know Equivesto has checked it and the company has also signed off saying, you know, we guarantee this is true. So if I'm reading it here, it's been checked. Okay. If it's projections for the future, or if they're talking about goals or there's no guarantee that those things will happen in the future. You know, plans often go awry and things come up that we can never plan for. But if they're saying, we've built this already and this is what we want to build next, we have verified that they have built that already and the whole agreement is properly structured for an investment in a safe and secure way. That's really what we're providing to investors. So when you as an investor are approaching an offering, you're then able to focus purely on do I like this industry? Is this company doing something that I care about? Do I think this makes sense? Where have I invested before? Do I want to diversify my portfolio of overall investments and include investments in this type of category of company? Do I like the CEO? Are they passionate and do I connect with their energy? Do I want to invest in this? You can do that knowing all the other potentially more boring checks have all been done entirely by Equivesto. If you as an individual investor want to get on the phone and discuss any of the deals with us, you can do that. You can reach out. We can book a time. We will have individual meetings with investors about, hey, I have $10,000 that I want to invest. Let's talk about potentially what type of sectors I would want to invest that in. That is something that we offer to our clients. But our goal, our focus is not to say, we think this deal is right for you and not to say, you know, we only take deals X, Y, Z on the Equivesto platform. We're about improving accessibility, improving access, welcoming more people on the company and the investor side to participate. What we're saying is every deal that's placed before you, we have done all this work to verify and complete what we call KYP, know your product. We have gone through, we know and confirmed all the details presented by this company. And we're not necessarily saying that this is the right company for you, but we're saying what the company is saying here is correct. And we have verified it as per our process. And that's really why you would want to work with and invest through a platform run by an exempt market dealer. Because, you know, if you're going to an angel network and you're going and you're just seeing companies pitch, 
nobody's doing due diligence really before they're pitching. They're checking to make sure you know that the, the company has a pitch deck and they're kind of at the right stage for the group, but they're not necessarily saying, we verified everything before you even see it. And that's what we at the EMD are doing. I know that was a bit long-winded, um, but I'm very passionate about this part and I wanted to make sure I could really clarify that um, for everyone. Okay, amazing. Um, I, oh, here's a good question. What, what is an offering memorandum and how is it different than an offering document found on most crowdfunding offerings? Okay, perfect. I think, um, I'm not sure if it came through to everyone, but you uh, glitched out there for a second, Ryan. The question was, what is an offering memorandum and how is that different than an offering document? So when companies go out to raise capital, there's a selection of different rules created by the securities regulators. One rule uh, called National Instrument 45106 has a section for a document called the Offering Memorandum. There's another rule called National Instrument 45110 Startup Crowdfunding, which I referred to a little bit earlier. And that is the new equity crowdfunding rules. And that set of rules requires something called an offering document. Essentially, either an offering memorandum or an offering document is a document required by the regulators for a company using that set of rules and is provided to investors as part of the entire campaign to tell investors everything that they would need to know about investing in this company. Offering memorandums are much longer. Um, they have many additional requirements, but they allow companies to raise much more money. They're much more robust. They're usually you know, 50 pages long or more. They can cost you know, $50,000 plus to create uh, an specifically for uh, 45110, the crowdfunding, it's much shorter. It's about 20 pages. It's still providing everything that an investor would need to know about investing in a company, but it's designed to be shorter, more concise, and easier to understand so that it's a bit cheaper for the company to prepare from the legal standpoint, but also so it's easier for a broader range of investors to read and understand. So on Equivesto, we, when companies make their offering available to the public, they're either doing so through the uh, 45110 offering document rules or the 45106 offering memorandum rules. So we highly recommend that investors take the time to log into Equivesto and then read those documents. The documents are attached to the campaign page of every company. Um, they're only visible once you've logged into your Equivesto account. You don't have to be approved, but please create an account and log in, and then you can see the documents. Companies raising from accredited investors only do not need to prepare either of those documents. So accredited investor only campaigns may not have an offering memorandum attached. But to summarize again, the difference between the two is the offering memorandum is much longer and requires audited financial statements. The offering document is a bit shorter and simpler and is usually written in a bit easier to understand language. Excellent. And uh, I think this is the final question, if no one else has any. I've invested. Uh, when will I receive my shares? Ah, this is an important question to know about not only our campaign, but any campaign on Equivesto. So how do things actually work in the nitty gritty? So you've created your account on Equivesto. It's approved. You've gone to the campaign page. You clicked invest. You signed your documents. You put your bank account information. You click the red continue button. And now your, your investment is complete from your standpoint. The funds are then moved from your bank account to the Equivesto segregated account. The funds are held there separately until the company's campaign ends. There's a campaign sort of timer that you can see for each campaign or based on when the company lists its closing. Uh, companies can have multiple closings, so make sure to check um, in the offering terms. There'll be uh, information there if there's multiple closings. But when the campaign ends and the closing begins, if the company has raised more than their minimum amount, then we start initiating the closing process. Equivesto reviews all the documents, make sure they're completed properly. And then we take the money raised for that company and the documents and provide that to the company and their lawyer. They do a review, they file some information with the regulators, and then they actually issue the shares from the company at that time. If the campaign was unsuccessful, then the funds uh, instead of being given to the company are actually sent from Equivesto directly back to 
all of the investors who signed up to participate. So when do people actually get their shares? The shares are issued by the company after the closing, um, whether there's multiple closings or a single individual closing, that's when the shares are issued to the investors. Companies can decide whether they want to issue uh, share certificates or issue uncertified shares and simply use their corporate ledger as a list of all the investors who participated. But either way, your proof of investment is those documents that you've signed on Equivesto that were countersigned by the company. Those documents are available to you at any time. If you log into Equivesto, go to your dashboard, and then go to transactions in the gray bar on the left-hand side, select the transaction you want to view, click the little I button to view it, and then you'll be able to see the transaction details for that transaction. Near the bottom, there'll be a little link that says, view your completed investor forms here. And that's where your proof of investment stays forever. Amazing. Thanks, Alex. And I think with that, we'll, we'll wrap up the webinar um, if there are no further questions. Um, amazing. And as always, uh, feel free to reach out to our team at any time. Uh, we're available. I'm going to post some links into the chat shortly. Uh, let, me, let me copy that right now. Amazing. So um, yeah, so if, if you're interested in investing, please visit our, our campaign page. I dropped it in the chat. Um, and if you create a, an account on Equivesto, as Alex mentioned, um, our documents, our offering memorandum and a complete pitch deck can actually be available to you. So if you haven't done that already, that's probably why you haven't seen it. Uh, you just simply need to start the process of, of creating an account. And then as soon as your email is verified, then you can go in and access those documents. Those are quite extensive and, and will teach you everything you need to know about Equivesto. And um, yeah, we look forward to welcoming you, you know, all of you as shareholders and co-owners of Equivesto. And I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.